But when I go back and I read about the uh, the great preachers of yesteryear, when I read about Catherine Coleman and Oral Roberts, C.T. Studd, and great people like that, and see what they accomplished for the Lord. Sometimes I tell myself, boy, let's say you only waste time. It's not necessarily so, but it gives me a desire, a passion, because if God can do it for them, he will do it for me as well. You understand what I'm saying? So we, we, we've got to advance. How about you? Are you satisfied with your spiritual life? Listen, although I'm the pastor, my spiritual life is not supposed to be different than yours, you know. We, 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 we read the same Bible. We follow the same things. You are just like I'm supposed to clean myself up, study, seek God's face, endeavor to help somebody else. You are supposed to do that as well. I trust that all this month as we talk about the Holy Ghost, that that's what would happen. When the Spirit comes, he teaches you all things. He would teach you not to mumble, not to grumble. He would teach you not to be deceitful, not to be lied. So if that is not being taught, do you have the Holy Ghost? This one tell you we need the Holy Ghost. But look at that. Look, look at this. Romans chapter 8 and verse 26. You're going to come across a word which says infirmities. A more modern translation for that is hardships. We're going to read it in two or three translations. Likewise, the, the Spirit helps our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. When you come to the altar and you ask me to lay hands on you or pray for you, and you don't tell me what is happening to you, how do I know? I could be praying for your feet, but something is really wrong with your eyes. But look at this scripture. Look at this scripture. The Holy Spirit helps in our hardship, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. Sometimes we don't know how to pray. We don't know what to pray. But the Spirit itself, that should be himself, the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. When I can't pray for myself, when you are not praying for me, the Holy Ghost is always making intercession for me. Whether you need to have a relationship with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is the third person of the Godhead. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father lives in heaven. The Son has been has ascended into heaven two years now. He sits at the Father's right hand. But the Holy Ghost came to earth on the day of Pentecost. He wants to live in people just like demons want to live in you because the devil always trying to conquer whatever God does. The Holy Spirit wants to live in you and he wants to come in you for a purpose. The church ought to be the most powerful thing on the earth. As a matter of fact, the church is, but we are not allowing that to come forth. The church is powerful. Heaven and earth will pass away. Not one jot or till will pass away from the word. And the Bible says, no matter people try to cancel the church and all kind of stuff. The Lord said, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. The church is the body of Christ. The church includes you. You need to have a more personal relationship with the Holy Spirit. He will stop you from being. The, let, me, let me go to scripture. Um, Acts, Acts 2 and verse 38 then Peter said to some people who asked him what must I do to be saved Peter said Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit is a gift to the believer eternal life is a gift to the world the Holy Spirit is a gift to the believer Listen to this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Uh, eternal life is a gift to everybody. But the Holy Ghost is not a gift to everybody. The Bible speaks about the Holy Ghost that the world cannot receive. Because they see him not. We bring that scripture up. The world cannot receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not for the world. And if you're a whirling, living in the world, you're going to deprive yourself of the power and the presence of the Holy Ghost in your life. The Holy Ghost is a gift to the church, to the believer. The eternal life is a gift to the world, to everybody. The Bible tells us clearly that the world cannot receive the Holy Ghost. 
The Holy Ghost is not a gift to the world. Even the spirit of truth. Let's go back to verse 16 in John. Verse 16. I like to tell you these things. And I will pray the Father. Jesus is speaking. And he will give you another comforter. Meaning the Holy Ghost. That he may abide with you forever. Go ahead. Even the spirit of truth. That's the Holy Ghost. Whom the world cannot receive. The world cannot receive the Holy Ghost. If, you can't, if you're not saved. If you continue to live like a whirling, you will never have that power in your life. Brother, the power that I'm talking about is not only for the past and the apostle and the prophet and the Sunday school teacher and all that. The power that I'm talking about is for you. When your little granddaughter starts to wheeze at three o'clock in the morning and I am now having my fourth turn, you think I'm going to get up my bed and come to your house? And even now when you can't visit under COVID, what do you think is going to happen? I don't have more power than you. I might yield myself more to the Holy Ghost and you might see him use me more. Not that I have more power because the Holy Ghost is a person and you cannot have more of a person. You cannot have more of your husband. You cannot have more of your wife because the Holy Ghost is a person. Nobody in the world has more of the Holy Ghost than me. Whether it's Benny Hinn, or Roberts, no matter who it is, nobody has more of the Holy Ghost than me because the Holy Ghost is a person. What happens is like a husband and a wife. When the woman misbehaves, the husband don't bring home the money. He doesn't sleep home. He doesn't do a lot of stuff. When she yielded herself to him, like the Bible says, submit yourself, you'll be surprised to see what you all can make men do, you know. But as soon as you get, so the point I'm making is that the more you yield yourself to the Holy Ghost, the more he uses you. But it's the same Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is a person. The Father is a person. The Son is a person. The Holy Ghost is a person. When you're filled with the Holy Ghost, there's no more of him that can come in you. It's a person. So we got to start yielding ourselves to the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit is a gift to you. We just read in Acts 2.38. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Repent, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is important, brethren. The Holy Ghost is just as important uh, as the, the engine in the airplane that's going to take you to Florida. If there's no engine in there, you are going nowhere because the engine is the power source. Listen to the scripture. Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 2. Let me show you the Holy Ghost. So you God should not have any fools in this kingdom. Look at Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 2. We're going to see about six different aspects of the Holy Ghost. Not six Holy Spirits, but six different attributes of the Holy Ghost. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. That's upon Jesus. The Spirit of wisdom. You ought to be wise. Because the Spirit in you is called the Spirit of wisdom. The Spirit of understanding. You ought to be able to understand when I preach. You ought to be able to understand when your wife talks to you, when your husband talks to you. You, got, you, be, you ought to be able to understand when you're listening to a lecture. The spirit of understanding. The spirit of counsel. You ought to be able to give good counsel and receive good counsel as well. Counsel is a word that means advice. The spirit of God does so much for us, brethren. Uh, the spirit of might and the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Those are different aspects. One Holy Ghost, but different attributes. So you can have a man that's a carpenter, a mason, a bus driver, an electrician, and all that all in one. is the same man, but different things, different operations. When you think of the power of the Holy Ghost, we need to pay more attention to the power of the Holy Ghost. We have some serious business in the church to attend to. We need to see the Holy Ghost in, in, in all of our services moving as he wants to move, as we allow him to move. And we will never have a dead service. We will never have an unproductive service. Listen to this scripture. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 17. Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So the praise of worship leader doesn't have to go fighting to get you to sing. Because there's liberty. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. There's freedom. Your feet will move. You're going to dance. Your hands are just going to go up in the air. Because there's liberty. You're not a bondage at all. You're not bound. There is liberty. Where the spirit of the Lord is. 
Sometimes you come to church, you feel tight. That's okay. That's the devil. That's a good chance for you to speak to the devil. Learn to speak to the devil. Talk to him. Tell him you can't have any way with me. Uh, you're not going to have any authority in my life. Uh, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. We know this quite well. I'm talking about why we need the Holy Ghost. We're going to deal with Acts chapter 47 on Thursday night. Come out and bring somebody else from another church, somebody else from here, whatever, because this is going to be very important and I may not be able to get back. But this is very, very important, Acts chapter 47. I won't keep you long tonight. But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Listen, he was speaking to people that were already saved. The Holy Ghost had already baptized them into the body of Christ. Why would he tell them, no, you'll receive power? Because this is a supernatural power. This is something above the Holy Ghost baptizing you into the body of Christ. This is something that God gives for the miraculous. Notice that nobody did these miraculous things uh, until after Acts chapter 2 in the book of Acts. Notice Peter in the very next chapter, I think it is, saying, silver and gold have we none. But such as they have given I thee, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, raise up and walk. This is the power of God that God has given to you. You must not let this power remain dormant. You must be singing like the children of Israel. Flow. Spring up, oh well. Spring up. We want a spring, not a trickle. A spring. Oh dear, I can't wait to, ask, to get to to chapter 47, but don't want to mutilate it now, so I'm not going to touch it tonight. But you're going to see, you can read it before I get you get back here, and you're going to see so much power in that anointing that flows from the altar and then flows out through the door. So this anointing is not just for inside here. This anointing is for our workplace, our community where we live, our neighborhood, in the supermarket. That's what this anointing is for. You're going to say, brethren, it's going to, it's even going to say, let me give, go ahead of myself, it's even going to say that because of this anointing, the anointing, this water is going to, this water is going to flow in the Dead Sea. Right now, nothing can live in the Dead Sea. But this text is telling us that when this water flows into the Dead Sea, Man, there are going to be so many fishes in that sea. So many fishes. So, so the theologians of today believe that this, this text that I'm telling you about water flowing into the, into the Dead Sea is for today. And they do expect that it won't be long before, uh, before although the, 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 the Dead Sea is toxic, they believe that this scripture is going to come to pass very, very shortly. We're in the Dead Sea as we know it today. You're going to be surprised to see the amount of fishes. Now I say fishes because I know you scholars know that singular sheep, plural sheep. Same thing with fish. Singular fish, plural fish. But when you see fishes, it means that it have flame fish, albacore, tuna, all kinds of things. You understand what I'm just saying? Talk to me if you understand. So fishes will give you that, that impression. So you could imagine the anointing, who you're going to reach when the anointing in your life flows out with you. When you go through this door tonight, you can imagine the different people that you, you're going to meet the educated and the uneducated. You're going to re reach the sophisticated and the unsophisticated. You're going to reach the rich and the poor because of that anointing that is on your life. Let me give you one final scripture. And this is in Isaiah, Luke chapter 4 and verse 18. Spring up, oh well. This is what I'm praying. I want to pray this every day with me. When they sung to a well, an inanimate object. When they sang to a well, a well. It gave forth water. At one time, the Lord said to, 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 to Moses to speak to the well. Speak to the well and it will bring forth water. You need to speak to, your, to, to, to the Holy Ghost in you. Talk with him. Have a conversation with him. Look here again at the power of the Holy Ghost. In Luke chapter 4, I'm going to begin at verse 18 and see what the Holy Ghost is for. Hear what Jesus said. Jesus went into the temple one day. They gave him the gospel to read. They, they, not the gospel. They gave him the Old Testament to read because the New Testament wasn't around then. And he opened it to Isaiah chapter 61. What I'm reading now is just a, a recording of what is in Isaiah already. Are you, are you with me tonight? Are, are you with me? We, we're going home early. You look, you look tired, but that's okay. The devil is a liar. Amen? 
So look what Jesus said. Jesus said, verse 17, um, verse 16. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, Jesus. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, because that's the day that the Old Testament people went to church. But the Bible tells us that it's just, it's just a shadow. It's just a type. It leads to something else. It, it leads to, to a rest. There remains a rest to the people of God. When you come to know Jesus Christ, you have entered into your rest. And the word Sabbath means rest. So it was just a type. And the Lord said, then don't let anybody try to, to, to kerfuffle you about the Sabbath days and things like that. It was just a shadow. It was pointing to something greater. All right. Um, so he came to Nazareth where he's been brought up. And as this custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. And there was delivered unto him a book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Now, I expect you, brethren. I'm going to read about five or six or seven things here. I expect you to be praying about this. And expect God to do these things through you. If not you, who? If not now, then. Things are getting worse. But God has already equipped us. Don't let's disappoint him. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. That's how good the Holy Ghost is to you. That's how he's going to. Don't tell me, I can't do it. I can't witness to anybody. No, you can. With the Holy Ghost that is in you. If you would pray. If you would pray. Talk to him. Say, Holy Ghost. As I go down the road by the bus stop. And get into this bus. Just let somebody come my way that I can share the gospel with. Next month, God's willing. Uh, during the month of June. I'm going to be reintroducing the idea again. Of winning souls. Going into the highways and hedges. Because God has called us to do it. We got to get out. I, I, as a matter of fact, I know that you're doing it, but we want to get out as a church. But I want to encourage you uh, personally. I, I notice that you're bringing people and you are encouraging people to come. That's fine. I want to continue to do that, but I want the church itself to go out. Amen. I want you to be able to say, you see those six people there? I led them to Christ. Uh, I brought them to church. God is depending on you. And through the Holy Ghost, you could preach the gospel to the poor. Now, the word gospel means good news. So when you go out there to talk to people who are unsaved, don't talk to them about the ungodly sister in church who live with this body next body. That's not good news. The word gospel means good news. And secondly, even if the sister was like that, the Bible tells you that you should not cast your pearls before swine. There's something that you should not even be talking to the unsaved about. There are some things that you should not be talking in front of your unsaved children or your unsaved husband about the pastor and the church folk. Don't cast your pearl before swine. So the gospel, the word gospel doesn't only mean news. The word gospel means good news. God has anointed you to share good news to the poor. Okay. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Oh, so many people are brokenhearted. Loss of a loved one in death. Brokenhearted through an abortion. When Mother's Day comes, you're so brokenhearted. Brokenhearted because your significant other, either your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your husband decided, I don't love you anymore. Um, you know, those people are broken. Those people need to be healed. Only today, one 18-year-old uh, boy went into Florida and started shooting in the supermarket. He deliberately went. He's a white guy. He deliberately went in the black community. Ten people are dead. Three people are injured. And it is because he had a problem. He was one of these broken people. He noticed that the, the, he thought that the white population was dwindling and he needed to even it up by killing some blacks. There are people with broken hearts out there. They come to church. They pass you at the front door. They don't say hello to you. They're not even thinking about you. They're thinking about their own problems. And you would magnify that. And you will sit down in the service for two hours. Don't give God the praise that is due to him. Don't receive anything for yourself. Because somebody who's broken. Huh? Somebody who's broken didn't say good morning to you. Come on, man. Let's not, let's, let's not magnify small things any longer. God has chosen you, you know, not only the pastor. They're broken-hearted people. 
in the nursery at St. Lucy. I would never see them, Pastor Chana. I said, Pastor, I, I would never see them. Your job is to minister to those brokenhearted people. There are so many people who are brokenhearted. You know how many people lost their loved ones and were not able to say a bye to them because of COVID? They were not even able to get near to them to say anything. And then when they, when they died and the bodies were delivered for burial, you know, they couldn't even open the casket. And you know how many people are grieving and how many people are brokenhearted. The church is here to be of a tender spirit. We are here by the Holy Ghost. We can't do it on our own. We can't do it on our own. But Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to do this. And this is why you need the anointing. Uh, to preach deliverance to the captives, those who are in bondage. People are in bondage to smoking. People are in bondage to pornography. People are in bondage to gossiping. People are in bondage to all kinds of stuff. There is so much bondage. And God said, church, I anoint, I anoint you to preach deliverance to the captives. Don't talk foolishness on Facebook all the time. Don't, 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 don't. You don't have to like everything that some stupid people write. You are a child of God. You are different. You are a child of God. You should be looking through. A, you should have a biblical worldview. Everything that you say you like and you take like to should have a biblical base that is pure and that's helpful to you and to the house of God. Anointed us to preach. There's a text in Psalm 100 and something. It says, my soul escaped like a bird out of the snare of the fowler. A snare is a trap. A fowler is a hunter. And David said, my soul escaped like a, listen, you need to escape from some friends you have, you know. Some of you need to escape from that boyfriend you have. Some of you need to escape from the deputy you have with your husband or wife. Some of you need to escape. Our soul is escaped. I don't understand the English of the Bible sometimes. Sometimes you hear people in the public try to be so sophisticated. Look at this. Is present escape past? How do you, how do you translate that? Our soul is escape. What, what sort of tense that is? I'm, not, I'm interested in tense. I'm interested in what it's saying to me. It seems to me like it's saying present continuous. But our soul is escaped like a bird out of the snare of the fowlers. There are people who are setting traps for you. Huh? Every day. But he said, the snare, the trap is broken and we are escaped. How? Next verse. How? 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 Because our help is in the name of the Lord. The Holy Ghost will help you to escape the traps that are set for you. The Lord has sent me to preach deliverance to the captives. The recovering of sight to the blind. Not only physical sight, but spiritual sight. Jesus said to some people, you have eyes, but see not. What does that mean? That there are two types of seeing. There's a seeing in the flesh, in the natural, like I'm seeing here in my glasses. But there's a seeing that you need to see in the spirit. Lots of church folk are not seeing in the spirit. How do you know, Pastor? By the way I see the answers they give me about certain things, the way they live. So Jesus said, you have eyes, but you still don't see. Because as people of God, we are not only supposed to be seeing 2020 through our glasses or whatnot, but we are supposed to be seeing in the spirit. So almost everything you do, everything you do should be based on a biblical worldview. You need to see things through the lens of the Holy Spirit and the Bible. So the Lord has sent to give the recovery of sight to the blind. And I'm praying tonight that we're because of sin or whatever the case may be. You have lost your spiritual sight. You are now blind in the spirit. I am praying that God will help us again to see in the spirit. When you see in the spirit, you don't complain about everything that happened in the service. You don't complain about this person that's sitting in your seat. You don't complain about the music too loud. Sometimes it is. I grant you that. But there's times that you got to make a sacrifice and don't be always complaining. The recovery sight to the blind and to set at liberty those that are bruised. And they're telling me that that word bruise really speaks of inner, inner, inner bruising. When you fall and that bruise, you know, you, you're little, you fell and you had a bruise on your knee. You know how it looked like that when you go to the bath. 
and all that. It, how, what could you how, could you imagine that down your throat because of acid reflux or something like that, and all your esophagus is is it, it, just like that. You could imagine that inner that inner bruising. That's physical, but this one speaks of something more. It speaks of inner hurts. There's some people with inner hurts. That's what the word bruise. So Sarah Liberty goes at her bruise. There's some people who've been raped by family friends and the mother's husbands and all kinds of stuff. 60 years later, they haven't said anything to anybody yet. You know how they're bruised on the inside? You know how much of life they have lost because they're always thinking about that bruising? Right now, in, in, in the war that's going on in Ukraine, there's a lot of that. So many girls and children, I heard on the radio, their children are being raped by the Russian police uh, soldiers. Children raped. Could you imagine those children do 60 years from now, how the bruise that they have inside them? Brother, this is why we need the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost. Uh, the pastor and the fivefold ministry can't be every place at the same time. God is calling upon you to rise up. And I'm going to ask you now to stand where you are and to talk to God about something. Oh, say for the last two years, I've been saying, stand quickly. For the last two years, I've been saying to the Lord, Lord, I want to be on the front line. If the doctors could be on the front line, they could be on the front line too. If the nurses are on the front line and the ambulance drivers and those who are testing, uh, if they're on the front line, I can be on the front line too. We need the Holy Ghost for all of these jobs. We need to make a sacrifice in the spirit. We, 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 we need to, to offer unto the Lord, present to the Lord our bodies as living sacrifices. Do you need for the Holy Ghost to move in your life? You wouldn't get more of the Holy Ghost. He is a person. But as you yield yourself, as you cooperate with the Spirit, huh? as you cooperate with the Spirit, you'll be surprised to see. If we could have a, a church, an entire church that's cooperating with the Spirit. I'm not necessarily talking about cooperating with the praise of worship leader. That's important. But I want to go a little deeper than that and cooperate. When the Spirit says, lift your hands in the sanctuary. When the Spirit tells you, get up and testify. When the Spirit tells you to sing, shout, jump, run. When the Spirit gives you instructions. If you will cooperate, if the spirit, I'm not talking about the flesh, if the spirit, we need the Holy Ghost. The simplicity of the gospel.